Welcome to Speak Sex. I am your host, Eve Eurydice, and today's guest is Brandon Hobson. Uh, he's a writer, uh, he's a, and, and a citizen of the Cherokee nation, which is so cool. <laughs> uh, Brandon has written four books, uh, Deep Ellum, uh, Desolation of Avenues Untold, Where the Dead Sit Talking, which was a finalist for the National Book Award, and recently, in 2021, they removed. Um, so, welcome to the show, Brandon. Thank you. Thanks for having <laughs> me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we we kind of have walked in like parallel uh, literary paths through the years, and every time we've uh, seen each other or talked to each other, we've discovered more <laughs> um, overlaps and. Uh, it's it's good. It's good to have. So I'd like to talk about uh, the the literary moment. You know, we're uh, now in the summer post COVID, <laughs> and we're opening up, and it feels like the world uh, the world is change. But even though you know we're always in change and we're always in process, it feels that the world is changing. You know, even faster. Um, than it felt before COVID. <laughs> um, our realities keep being updated. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk to you in general uh, about what that means for literature right now, um, you know, in 2021. What should it be doing? What can it be doing? Uh, what's the job of art <laughs> in this moment, you know, in this like highly um, hyper capitalist, right? And, and hyper imperial yeah. <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, how yeah. do we speak truth, right? Well, it seems to me, you know, that literature has become more sensitive now than ever before, at least the, the readers of of literature and that they they feel um there need to be um content warnings and and um trigger warnings right which i'm all for because i have triggers also but um i i i i feel like over the the years and you're one who comes out of a school of experimental fiction and really sort of pushing the boundaries. And I think that's what really drew me into um, reading was, was reading the, the type of discovering the type of literature that goes beyond um, simply entertaining and which is what art is supposed to do, right. To, to access parts of ourselves that we're not comfortable talking about that people, you know, the human condition that people are struggling with that feels very honest and that in a sense becomes a gift for us, the reader, that we feel like the writer is giving us more than just simply a story. And that often means accessing really deep parts of ourselves, right, and our our passions and our problems and, and um, coming to that as a reader, I think, is is very exciting um, when when you can allow yourself to open up and access right the way that characters feel and the, the way that the text is doing things that feels like it's it's very alive and that it's more than just simply telling a story um, and so I I don't know I mean I feel really uh, I, 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 I just feel very strongly about that that it's be, that we've become very sensitive to you know the fact that oh no there's a dead dog in this story trigger warning there's a dead dog right or there's a you know um, um, a mention of um, you know someone I, I don't know I mean it's, it's 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 just gotten ridiculous it feels like Right. Do you feel yeah. do you do you feel like that also? 
Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I think the whole I think the whole thing has become a mess. And when I talk to my friends, you know, who are artists, who are creatives, they're all echoing, you know, in their own words, this type of sentiment, which is there is some sort of censorship. Um, you know, there there are you know category too many categories uh, that we're supposed to kind of you know either fit in or avoid. Um, and in general, it feels a little totalitarian, right? So even though it's our, let's say, our own side, <laughs> like our progressive uh, political side, right? Um, it still feels totalitarian. Uh, for, for a creative who is motivated by discovering the unknown, right? By the risk of what's on the other end, of this of this journey through the darkness you know yeah. um yeah so uh, and how do we go get a, around that um i don't know i mean what i what i've done is i really um have uh you know tried to go against it <laughs> um and make you know yeah. more and more like let's say shocking right work yeah. um and because that's the only thing that interests me, you know. So if if it doesn't get the uh, like whatever you know bought or 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 um, exhibited enough, that's that's the price I'll pay for now. And there is always like history, you know, the bigger container of time mm -hmm. of human time. But for me, if I don't feel uh, danger, I Ooh. don't you know I I don't per I don't participate in in making art or you know writing i have to feel like oh my god i'm gonna get burned at the stake for this and then i'll do it <laughs> yeah and yeah what do you do you feel like you've always been like that or is that something that um when you i i know that you you got your mfa from brown is that correct and that school i think with robert yeah. coover really pushed i think is you know very I mean, known for being very ex right. experimental. Um, is that something that you discovered more about yourself when you started doing gra the graduate work? No, no, no. I was always, yeah, it was always my okay. interest. It was part, you yeah. know, like uh, for me, writing was very much an act of rebellion, right? So yeah. all of my choices, you know, uh, have involved some sort of resistance. Uh, otherwise, I might as well just do what I'm told and like get the perks and <laughs> chill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like the first literature that even attracted my attention um, outside, like just consuming everything, which you do when you're a kid, uh, was uh, surrealism. When I was in Greece, you know, and I was a preteen or, I don't know, early young teen. Um, and I just like devoured all of the work of the surrealists and that... Um, you know, it, and ex opened opened up for me, you know, this realm of possibilities where I could find a voice, because everything yeah. was kind of like allowed, right? The most like uh, unspeakable <laughs> stuff <Yeah>. could be spoken. <laughs> so yeah, I think like from the beginning, my 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 definition of it was very uh, chthonic, you know. Um, yeah, not not so much. Uh, Personally, you know, from, I, I've never been interested in telling stories of what happens, you know, in the world as we know it that surrounds us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it, I mean, it's, that's interesting you say that, that, yeah, I feel like your work really, really does push the, the boundaries, the, right, the work that I've read. Um, and, I think early on reading people like you and, and Kathy Acker. Oh yeah. That, Kathy for sure. <laughs> yeah. I, that sort of opened up this possibility of well, not only just, and I'm not just talking about content, but I'm talking about form as well. That's right. And, and the, the, the early, which we talked about in my, Miami, you and I talked one night, and I told you there is an anthology that I have around here somewhere. Um, 
the Iowa Anthology of Innovative Fiction that you that's where I first discovered your work. The Kathy Acker's in there and um, you know, David Foster Wallace and, and um, William Gass wrote the introduction. It's just this amazing book and has all this. I don't know if, if uh, Ballman's in that or not, but I, I but don't the, think the, so. Yeah. He's not in that one, but 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 I discovered his work along in the early '90s, along all of you together, and it just sort of really opened up this sort of world of wow, I didn't know you could do this, and this is really exciting stuff here, right? And and so it became more on one hand. You know, I was reading the um, sort of uh, kitchen sink realist, I guess, is a term I think Salman Rushdie uses, right? To, to, to Raymond Carver and and um, the sort of minimalism that feels very hyper real, right? The sort of domestic, um, domestic realism at that time and before that and really loving that. And then so when I discovered all this sort of a little bit more innovative stuff it it was uh, as exciting so i felt like wow literature is doing all this you know and and it became very inspiring for me as a writer um and so uh so i mean i want to thank you for for that because it was you know it was at a time pre-internet you know and and um, just sort of feeling like you discover you're in a bookstore and you just find kind of a right um, a gem. Yeah. Well, I think and it's the fearlessness. Yeah. It is. It's the fearlessness, and and again with with structure mm -hmm. and 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 language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it becomes more than just the you know, as an undergraduate, when you're sort of taught, or even in high school, when you're sort of taught, you know, this is um, basically what a story is involved with. It's just a conflict and the narrative arc and, and the more traditional, you know, we're always introduced first, I think, to the more traditional method of story. So I just, that the these wonderful birds fell into my lap, right? with all these sort of magical qualities about them that I was able to, you know, and, and you being one of them. Thank right. You. And so, yeah. So I, um, it was just uh, sort of like a gift and that's what I always come back to is I, I, what I feel like is what I feel like literature should be doing is giving a gift to the mm, reader. Yeah. And, and that gift I think sometimes requires work of the reader, I guess. It's, yeah. it's a, it's a very strange thing because I know that, um, you know, we're not just the, the gift involves the reader accessing and thinking about parts of themselves that they don't normally think about. Yeah. That's the gift. Like I'm starting to understand this about myself right um after i read this or about who i am my identity and what i love what i'm interested in what turns me on what gets me off and that d is a sort of gift right oh yeah for sure yeah i mean i call it the the gift of freedom you know and yes. yeah, yeah 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 and we are you know from from the beginning of consciousness, right? Like as soon as we uh, get to understand our name, we mm -hmm. are losing freedom, right? We're being restricted. <laughs> We're told yeah. this is the right way. Don't do this. Don't do that. No, no, no. You know, don't sit that way. Don't speak that way. Don't go there. Don't touch this, right? <laughs> so to undo that, <laughs> we have, you know, we have these perks like art where you don't no longer have to feel restricted so yeah the question your question comes it becomes important like what do you do with these like uh, trigger warnings <laughs> um when right, right? 
part of the of the journey into into the unknown part of the journey of change uh, you know kind of like requires that discomfort and and those those um you know the like whatever you want to call it the ugly parts are also our parts you know like we're blood and guts and um we're not that pretty <laughs> all the time yeah, yeah. <laughs> right yeah I, I I mean the word discomfort is really a, an important word right mm-hmm. um, and and I'm, I'm I'm interested I so in, in my in my new book the removed I I part of I mean the, there's a section that becomes very I, I think I mean I want it to be very surreal um, with one of the characters who um, overdoses and enters the darkening land, which is which is a a place that's mentioned in Cherokee mythology, the darkening oh, land. Oh, nice. Yeah, where where souls go after death until justice is served, and so I sort of created this darkening land to be kind of not much different than the earth that we live on right now, but at the same time is sort of ghostly and people coughing dust and um right so but but the uh, part of i what i wanted to do is arouse some sort of discomfort in the reader and the 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 um the way that the character is the object of a video game that's shooting natives Right. Out of race, out of racism that these guys are developing this shooting game that shoots only Native Americans. And so the character in my book becomes very afraid that, you know, here I am in a place where people are pointing guns at me and it's it's a sort of game. Right. And and. You know, to get people to think about something like guns and shootings and how, I mean, we're in 2021 and we're, we've already had, I don't know how many. Oh yeah. Mass- record number again. We're at record number again. And, and here we are, in, you know, half of the year, if, if that is gone. Um, and I, I guess it, it, it's a way to talk about things through, through our art it's a way to talk about things that is it, it arouses discomfort, right? Because yeah. it's not com- it's not comfortable to talk about these kinds of, of things. I think for especially for a lot of people, um, but they need to be talked about. And um, I, I, in some ways, I think through surrealism or absurdism. Um, becomes a fun way for me to be able to talk about it. So the, there's sections um, that a lot of readers, like Book of the Club readers, I, Book of the Month Club readers, I don't know, that are a little bit more traditional or conservative in their novel that they read, be, come away, I think, sometimes. I've gotten some messages where people just are like, wow, this is just too weird. I don't know if it's supposed <laughs> to be if it's supposed to be real or if it's supposed to be fantasy and I, uh, my answer, I mean, you know, things don't feel resolved in the world. Things do feel surreal in the world. Um, the oh, answers, yeah, COVID. Come on. <laughs> right. Yeah. Is that, it's the most surreal thing, right? Isn't it that, I mean, a few years ago, would we have thought something like that would have happened? And, and um, so yeah, I mean, I I'm interested in and in disrupting the narrative, and sometimes not giving traditional closure or resolution in stories um, be, for all those reasons, right? For the reader to to do the work, for the reader to uh, think about how disrupted the um, things are right now in the world, and and so. Um, there, there. That's not a real popular, I think, idea, 
right? To come, I mean, there, there are those of us, I think we're probably a minority, there's a small minority of us, right? Who are interested in doing that maybe. But I, I don't know, I think I, I think I would argue that literary fiction should be doing that. I agree, I agree. Yeah. And I think that it's not a minority necessarily of us writers as much as it's definitely, you know, not encouraged by the means of centralized production. So there are fewer yeah. and fewer like writer co-ops, there are fewer and fewer like small literary publishers um, who will even pay you a penny. So what happens is your agent, if you have one, and your editor, if you have one, will encourage out of your ideas the one that's normative. And right. that's how the system perpetuates itself, right? So for me, even... Um, for me, part of the problem here is how many of us have taken it for granted that this is what we're going to do for a living, which kind of like didn't used to be the case. You know, it was mm. it was always a crapshoot whether you could live off your writing or not. And there was never any security. And now with like creative writing programs and all of that, like a lot of students, you know, uh, go into it thinking they're going to have a career. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. what? It's like, dude, you have the wrong idea about the whole thing to begin with like yeah you know there are professional writers who are like copywriters or journalists mm -hmm. and they're professionals mm -hmm. you be that but like take the creative out of it because that makes you like for sure unprofessional <laughs> you're yeah. a disruptor you know that's my yeah. idea of it you know and so if there is a system in place um the system wants us to write that story the system wants us to write about the conflict and the resolution and the system trains the reader to expect the same shit. And in the, the comfort of the repetition is numbing, right? So to me, like, I think the, the whole patriarchy reinforces this, like, kind of drama, which started in ancient Greece, right, of, like, the men, you know, competing, right, which creates conflict among men and women, um, and then how that gets resolved, you know, and the folly of men and... Um, I find it personally, I find it like trite, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, sure. I mean, I can be entertained, you know, by it, like in a movie theater or, you know, something minor, but I definitely, w you know, wouldn't give it like hours of my time. Um, I, I do like something that anything that goes against that, you know, um, that kind of like shakes up the, the system in its, you know, in its foundations. Um, so like, for example, I think anything Cherokee would, <laughs> by definition, you know, go against like the normative system, right? Um, and, and this whole movement that's happening now, among the, of course, it's always among like the elite, but you know, uh, it's called rewilding, right? So yeah, yeah, they go out there and they plant like a couple of trees or they go and they spend a couple of days cleaning the reef, the ocean reef or something, right? But I like yeah. that concept of rewilding, you know, as kind of like a literary concept and an artistic concept, you know, kind of like bring the wild back into the work um, yeah. and let this kind of like over civilized veneer, <laughs> you know, go f fall apart. Um, that feels to me like a more, um, you know, yeah, it does feel to me like a, a more a human and 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 uh, exciting, you know, way to move forward. Um, mm -hmm. That includes consciousness of the moment, you know. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, we have kind of like used up the resources of these dumb, uh, you know, literary tropes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think um, especially with. You know, I'm Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, one of three. Um, there are three bands of Cherokee, and and I'm one of the three um, being enrolled in, in Cherokee Nation. And I think a lot of people um, are are so uneducated about Native life, and and there's so many different tribes also, and the that they want the the fiction to learn um as if they they want to 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 learn something <laughs> about native life which is um 
I mean, this should be taught in schools, right? It should be uh, in, I don't know that schools, maybe they're, they're, they're going to start doing a better job, but, but um, the history of um, how bad tribes have been treated by the, the U S government and, but, but they, they come to fiction wanting to read and learn about the culture, I think, um, more than more than anything else, or at least that's the, that's the impression I get from a lot of uh, um, a lot of readers um, is that I want to learn about. <laughs> so I'm from from Oklahoma, and you 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 live in Oklahoma, and and someone says I want to learn about Native life. Where do I go? And and it's like just walk outside <laughs> because it's it's no different, right? It's it's. It's it's you know in in Hollywood I think is getting better now. Um, my friend Sterling Harjo has a uh, an F series on FX that will I think start in the fall. It just premiered at the Tribeca um, Festival in New York. He was just there I think yesterday or the, the day before. But um, called Reservation Dogs and um, it's it's uh, set in Oklahoma about Native teenagers. Um, so I think that Hollywood is, is starting to pay attention a little bit more because in the past they've only portrayed natives as 18 from the 1800s sort of, you know, wild and, and um, shooting arrows at people. And, and you know, that, that there should be a native sitcom there. There should be um they they should show the the native um attorneys who are out there that are are no different than anybody else but i i do think i mean there's there's some hope that that's that's going to be different but but i i think that you know so hollywood is has really added to that stereotype um and even cnn you know not addressing natives and and saying um when when they were um talking they were saying um why I, I think this is over the election right the 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 percentage of native voters are white african-american asian-american something they use the words something else right which is which i um would assume would be native americans but uh you know it's 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 there's a there's a long way to go but i guess my point in saying all this is i'm I'm not interested necessarily in educating the public on the history of um, of the Cherokee Nation when there are plenty of plenty of nonfiction books out there, right? And the education system should be should be educating on that. But I'm interested in um, fiction as I'm in interested in creating art that goes that does more than just talks about the culture of. Cherokee Nation people or or culture or in general or the lifestyle or certainly not ceremony um, or or those kinds of things that, you, you know, it's really people don't like to talk about, but more doing doing something else and doing something that I feel like involves. Um, I, I'm like you, I'm interested in surrealism. I, I'm interested in um experimenting playing with form and those kinds of things that um, and doing it at least in these last this last book in a little bit different way um, when I'm talking about native native literature I guess um, not all my books are about native have native characters right my early books you know Deep Ellum right. is, is, yeah yeah Desolation um I actually have a, a, a really, back in 2005, a really short book experiment. It's only like 100 pages, and it's um, sub levitationist and it was just mm. uh, um, <laughs> just very, very um, surreal, right? It came out of my interest in, in surrealism. And so um, <clears throat> I I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't want to be easily defined as this specific type of prose right yeah and i don't writer. think i don't think you are i'm just i but I, I did bring that as an example um the same way that i bring you know like my own you know greek or at least like early greek right um yeah heritage is an example because there is that um you know closer proximity i think 
to like the pre-lingual or the pre, um, you know, pre-imperial, <laughs> yeah. pre-colonial, yeah. something, whatever, however, whatever the word is, you know, a, a, the fact that I don't even know the exact word is exactly what I'm talking about, yeah, to something mm -hmm. that has not been defined already and, you know, put in some sort of like, you know, stereotype. And I think having access to that is what, you know, makes for great art because you can like bypass all the stages in between, the conventions, and get mm -hmm. to that source. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I, I, you know, I, I feel that, um, you know, be, coming from a culture that, you know, had a, a, a long civilization that's not been recorded necessarily, right, for our benefit, but still exists, I think that's like a power. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think my culture has that. <laughs> Um, I mean, we have everything that's been recorded, right? But um, we, you know, I come from an island that's pre-Homeric. And like the town where I was born, <laughs> where my parents were born, um, was a, or mentioned in Homer and has a, 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 you know, ruins, of course, like everywhere in Greece, all over where we live, um, yeah. w which are pre-Homeric, and they include like the earliest temple to Orpheus. So, <clears throat> you know... My point is that that sense of what, of all, all that going on that I live so close to, uh, that has not really been translated to me, but that's great. <laughs> yeah. You know, because it's just like there to pick up on, uh, you know, like that, that intuitive um, language that I think is the, the, you know, the communication that goes on through great writing that's passed beyond the words. You know, what's left yeah. unsaid, yeah. Nothing really has changed. And time, you know, to me, when I when I visited res reservation life, at least, it felt very much like being at home because time was not like, you know, uh, American time. You know, American time is like on speed, yeah. right? <laughs> and, yeah. And then yeah. when I go home, I'm like, whoa, this is so slow, you know, but it's like yeah. closer to like seasonal time. Um and I have to like get into that, and then it's you know it's great. So I have I've I have felt that connection that like my where you know where I come from mm -hmm. um, is you know is very much like native like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's one of the things I love about um, New Mexico. Here is, um, I mean, in some ways, it's it's like Oklahoma and that, um, um, you know, you, you, sometimes it's, it's so laid back, right. Um, that, um, it, you don't sort of feel that pressure of, of time. And, um, I mean, I live where I live, it's, it's Southern New Mexico, right. So we're pretty close to the, the Mexico border is just, I think 40, 40 or 50 miles, you know, um, down the road, you know, but, uh, yeah. um, that's fire. I want to come, you know, I want to come over. <laughs> I want to come visit. Yeah. <laughs> I well, love New Mexico. I love it. I love it. I could live there for sure. Um, yeah. when I was, uh, you... cause I went to see you, uh, I got one of my, you know, creative writing masters at CU. Um, and I was oh, also yeah. going to Naropa. That's where I worked with Ginsburg and Boros. <laughs> so anyway, oh, so we God. used to come to New Mexico all the time. Um, and I, you know, I just felt so at home. It's exactly what, you know, what you're describing. It felt familiar. I, 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 I just think it was such a great area for an artist residency because there's, there's a few restaurants there and there's an old, there's a movie theater that um, is an old movie theater and it's there's a there's a little town square um um it's it's just a really really beautiful place and the sun you know shines almost every day yeah and the the the, the buildings are so um you know adobe they're adobe and i just thought i just i just always mm. think you know it's such a great place for an artist residency yeah. right yeah. here that makes sense yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna so... pull some money together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah like get a couple of buildings and turn them into a retreat for writers. I, yeah. I, I would love to do that. Yeah. yeah that's a I, great way to kind of like bring people you want to hang out with to you. <laughs> while, yeah. Right. While you're working and raising your exactly. kids. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah, for just, sure. Yeah. Talk writing all day or whatever, mm. like every time you meet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What are you working on now? Do you know? Yeah, I am. I actually, I, I already sold, I sold a book to Scholastic. Oh, you wow. know Scholastic? Yeah, well, it's a, I know like Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, and it is. It's a. It's more of a, a like a children's, a middle grade book, um, and it's. Uh, but I'm setting it here in the land of enchantment in New, New Mexico, um, and uh, you know there are missing and murdered indigenous women that the numbers are astronomical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read about that. Yeah. Yeah. And and so this is about a uh, native Cherokee uh, family whose mom has been missing for years. And, and and the boy, the brother and the sister want to go find her. And so, um, yeah, so it's uh, it's it's a little bit different. Um, I'm, I hope to finish it this summer at, at U-Cross. Oh, wow, that's fast. Yeah. Well, I've been I've been I started it, I think, in February. Yeah, so it's um, you know, it's uh, and it, it's 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 a short book. It's going to be you know, it's not 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 very long. So, um, so I, so I'll, like I'll finish. A, a native femicide for kids. <laughs> That's the concept yeah. you sold. <laughs> yeah, native. There's um, and and then there's some sort of uh, there's some more native. You know, I'm so fascinated with uh, Cherokee mythology, like I am Greek mythology. Yeah, me too. I used, yeah. I, I used to teach Greek mythology when I taught for, I taught seventh graders for uh, three years and um, we spent a long time on Greek mythology and I had them dress up, uh, you know, as, as gods and goddesses and characters from mythology. And it was, they really loved it. I had a, I, that was my favorite unit um, to teach uh, when I did that. But um, so this, yeah, this is kind of a, um, children's book that'll introduce some more uh, mythology and stories and um, um, you know talking um, animals and spirit more spiritual stuff that I think just hopefully will appeal, yeah hopefully it'll appeal to a younger audience you know younger readership yeah. and yeah yeah. Yeah. I want to write, but you know, I never get around to it because I feel like there is always more pressing work. But I do. I have always wanted to rewrite the myth of Eurydice. You know, from the point of view of Eurydice, right? Uh, yeah. Who is silenced? Uh, and and, yeah. and the story, as I understand it, as and I've always understood it, is that Eurydice, being an, and she's a tree nymph, right? According to the the, the myth, uh, so uh -huh. she, she tends to her elm i believe right that's her job so yeah um and of course she's pre-patriarchal right so there is no like wedding per se or you know the, you know sexuality such such as it is is like part of nature you know when you're mm -hmm. going through springtime you mate and then <laughs> you give birth if you conceive and then you rest right and it, it, there is none of all of the tropes um of civilization and so yeah. orpheus sees her, pulls her into that narrative, and she quickly turns into the underworld and becomes famous, you know, ever after for this, mm -hmm. you know, silent part of the, like, objectified, mm. you know, uh, yeah. whatever, babe, yeah. <laughs> bride. I... <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've always thought, oh, you know, write, to write the book set in the underworld, um, you know, kind of like where she also like meets the other characters of, of Greek from Greek mythology, uh, the mortals, you know, in the underworld and tell her story in flashbacks would be so fun to do. But I, yeah, you should you should really do that. I mean, there's that. That woman that writes, is it Madeline Miller who wrote Circe and uh, right, Circe? Yeah. Um, you know, she. The, uh, those have been like bestsellers her books and she um i think she's a high school teacher and and you know uh, uh but she's re she's rewritten 
books. Yeah. I haven't read yeah. her, her books, but I think with you adding a, a, a different sort of perspective on it, because um, I think Eurydice is not one that is really taught a lot and and talked about it seems like right um as much as as some of the others and and i'm not saying you'd have to write to a young audience but i mean i think just uh, it's it's fascinating you know i'm really fascinated by mythology and storytelling stories the way that stories uh right. grow out of yeah. myths and yeah i am too and i think that you know they because they are the earliest versions of what we're still speaking right so they kind of like give us a clearer view of what it, a lot of you know what we're dealing with now is about i think you know like when you go back to those versions you understand even you know your own like psychology your own human exchanges through a simpler you know lens so yeah i, yeah, I, I find them very very interesting that way kind of like a you know, they they um, make everything much more concise and precise, you know. So Orpheus is a great character because he is the first form of Christ. He's the first martyr. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's the first monotheist prophet, so to speak, you know. Um, mm -hmm. He's the first superstar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And... M musician right or right yeah musician. he was yeah, yeah he was very famous uh, in the whole like yeah. known world <laughs> yeah <laughs> for his music yeah. Which... <laughs> yeah, everybody soon <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah. uh uh r r reminds me a little bit of uh did you ever read the salman rushdie's first children's book um harun in the sea of stories no i have it i, I don't think i got through it no i yeah, it, it's 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 really except I I like a lot of his work because he he you know oh I love his early work love 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 yeah yeah he reaches into mythology and stories and and uh, but um, midnight the, children a and the one he wrote about Benazir Bhutto so good what was that anyway yeah no I love all of his work until the fatwa book <laughs> and then yeah. I, I honestly like didn't have an, uh, I bought a couple of things. Oh, the ground uh, shaking beneath her teeth, uh, her feet. Oh, ground beneath right? her feet, yes. Yeah, feet, yeah, yeah. yeah. I bought yeah. it, uh, but, but it just, you know, uh, it became kind of a challenge. Uh, as much as I it's... really adored his early work, um, mm -hmm. yeah, then the later work felt more cerebral and, and, and less um, emotional, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, he... He's a really, really funny writer, and in he's some brilliant. ways, reminds it is brilliant. Yeah, I think he's brilliant. He reminds me of Thomas Pynchon, um, in many ways. Um, and that I think that both of those writers are just so brilliant and brilliant, what, yeah. what, they, what they do with language. He does some amazing, funny stuff, but uh, Early but there's a character. Also. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a, a a character in in his his children's book who, um, kind of like Orpheus, who's a, except in, not a musician, but he's a storyteller. And women uh, just swoon around. <laughs> right. That's a, reminded me of uh, yeah that uh, Orpheus character in some ways. So ah, I um, I read it. I have it somewhere here waiting for its turn. <laughs> maybe, yeah, yeah. Maybe now is the moment you brought it out of its ashes. <laughs> That's what I hope. You know, with with this book, I I sold to Scholastic. Um, I hope it will appeal to adults as as much as as to you know to younger reader to middle middle readers I think you know middle school or or, or high school. Um, so uh, I always put in some um, I always put in some secret uh, pop culture references um, you know to to music and and uh, uh, yeah. The, you know Bauhaus or or the Smiths or something and and um that's what I did with my new book as well I like to throw in those sort of 80s when I was a kid in the 80s um you know and and first discovering this it's kind of like with discovering literature my my brother uh 
you know, did, went to college and, and brought all this great music back that I had, I had not heard before and uh, sort of opened up this great world. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, well, um, I'm looking forward to... Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. What is the title of it? Do you know? Working title? Uh, the working title is uh, Ziggy and Moon in the Land of Enchantment. Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> I don't know that. Moon, uh, Ziggy Starburst. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, that's yeah. another pop culture reference. Yeah, Ziggy yeah. is uh, Star- and 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 well, and Moon is his sister is named Moon. Ah, okay. Yeah, his sister. So Ziggy and Moon are the the two siblings. Main characters and, um, for going on the journey. The, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, they 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 encounter a, a wide range of uh, um, characters and talking at Chupacabra. Talking chupacab coyote. That's um, nice. Wow, love that. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. yeah. A lot of a lot of animals, and and some of the animals that come out of Cher- Cherokee mythology. There's a lot of animal myths. Yeah, right? so, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's your writing schedule? My schedule? Yeah. I uh, part of the reason I look so much like shit right now is. <laughs> <I apologize. laughs> Uh, because I stayed up very, very late last night writing. I usually, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm much more of a night bird, a night mm-hmm. owl. And, um, and so, yeah, I haven't, uh, I, mornings, um, very rarely do, do I work. Yeah, um, the same way I, I work at night. Yeah. I work, I work very well at night because yeah, me too. everything falls silent. Yeah, me too. Same. Yeah. And, and it feels very much at peace and i yeah. feel like in the mornings that's in the mornings are when all the emails come in when everybody is posting on social media or something and and people are texting me um and then it slows down the afternoons i can write so i i sometimes will write and it's great this summer because it's just i'm on my own schedule so i'm not teaching right now so i will um you know sleep late of course and then um you know drink coffee and check go through all the emails and and in the in the afternoon i'll write a little bit and then i exercise um and then um um you know do stuff with my kids or do family stuff and then come back at night and uh and and usually write late into the night so yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I do. That's what Cooper does too. He still does, actually. You know, there are a few of us yeah. who, like, you can text at three a.m. and you know the answer immediately, and they're writing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. And I, I feel the same. You know, partly because I mean, I can't even write in the afternoon. I, I, I really, uh, it has to be past midnight for me for, for it to really work well. Um, uh, and yeah. I feel that that's the you know, it's again about the freedom, you know, that I feel free at last, right? Free from identity, mostly. You yeah. know, free, free from my, my place in the world and from the world around me. So I can just, you know, go deep as if I, you know, weren't just I, as if I were, you know, like consciousness in general. Yeah. Which, There's... again, I want to say, you know, goes back to your original point of like the trigger warnings. That, you know, truth is, for me, where we're free from identity, you know, where we are, like, overlapping mm-hmm. with each other. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. And and there's something magical at, at, at when it feels like the world is, or not the world, but, I mean, the, the maybe here the country, right, is mostly at silent and so late at night, that's when I have always been like, even since I was a kid, I was, you know, I would stay up late and, and, um, so I, and think, I, <laughs> and think, yeah. and yeah, my, my, you know, the, the, the electricity comes on and it really lights up in the brain, yeah, yeah. um, at, at that, at that time. And, um, uh, it can happen during the day, but it feels a little bit more sort of, structured um in terms of the work like or a little bit more controlled whereas at night i feel like i can really just allow myself to to go wild 
wild in the country, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. let's go wild. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So, Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Well, this was a great conversation. We could go yeah. on and on. <laughs> we could. Yeah. We should have done this at two in the morning. Yeah, right? we we, we <laughs> could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and we'll do it again, I hope. And uh, yeah. thank you for your time and thank you for joining us today. And thank everybody you. out there, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being open to this uh, liberation conversation. And until next week, keep speaking sex. If I could make love incessantly, I would be God. My name is Eurydice Eve, and I'm a writer and artist best known for writing for Scribner and Spin, and these are my conversations with leaders in diverse human communities. Join our flow and stay with us for a while.